Today at last he came back to me. I always knew he would one day come. I could see in him still the boy he was his lifetime ago. And in his eyes that same pale grey light that looks through this world and sees another. I on lonely sleeve galleon in the Sperron Mountains of Tyrone. Loch Fay was a place of desolate silence and enthrallment to me when first I happened on it as a boy riding my bike. It came to obsess me. In developing this place print a lifetime later, I returned to an immature short story I had written about that obsession at the time, and had by some instinct kept. But the loch has been transmogrified now, to a country park. All wonder is gone. My title here quotes a Yeats poem about such enthrallment as mine was. Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild. But I find Yeats's fairies rather romantic with a capital R. The fairies that I felt haunting this place are ugly, rancorous, merciless, stealing a baby girl to suck out her soul. And most terrible of them all is the Kelech, seductress and hag, who lurks for her human prey on the bed of the deep mountain lake. Welcome to Place Prints, a 10-part audio series by David Rudkin that gives a voice to the stories that haunt different locations across the British Isles. The seventh in the series is titled To the Waters and the Wild and is set in County Tyrone. This place print will begin after a brief introduction from the writer. Hi, on lonely sleeve galleon in the Sperron Mountains of Tyrone. Loch Fay was a place of desolate silence and enthrallment to me when first I happened on it as a boy riding my bike. It came to obsess me. In developing this place print a lifetime later, I returned to an immature short story I had written about that obsession at the time and had by some instinct kept. But the loch has been transmogrified now to a country park. All wonder is gone. My title here quotes a Yeats poem about such enthrallment as mine was. Come away, O human child, to the waters and the wild. But I find Yeats's fairies rather romantic with a capital R. The fairies that I felt haunting this place are ugly, rancorous, merciless. They're more the fairies of Allingham's haunting poem called just that. We folk, good folk, trooping all together. A band of little elemental terrorists, dare one say. Living on pancakes of foam, planting obstructive thorn trees to dance around. Stealing a baby girl to suck out her soul. And most terrible of them all is the Kelech, seductress and hag, who lurks for her human prey on the bed of the deep mountain lake.
Today at last he came back to me. I always knew he would one day come. I could see in him still the boy he was his lifetime ago. And in his eyes that same pale grey light that looks through this world and sees another. On a late summer's towards evening, that was, the first time he saw me. There was no car park then. No picnic tables, no litter bins, no waymarked lakeside paths. Narrow then and rough, the mountain road skirted my bare wild shore. Spinning in from my left, at the sight of me he braked and half stood from his bike. A rusting old upright with saddlebag and no front lamp. Then left it lying at the roadside and came across amid the heather to stand on my edge and gaze on me. He was late in his teens, but still a boy. Awkward and cheaply dressed, thin wind cheater, the grey flannels boys then wore. And that poor clothing clung about him somewhat for it had been drizzling much of that day. And I can see how stiffly he moves at first, so he must have cycled far. And whenever he has come from, beyond and amid these hills, it has been hard work on that old bike. From whatever direction, at the last he has taken the junction southward onto my lonely mountain road. He'll be making, I think, for whatever he calls home, for the light's soon going. And here I lie... And I astonish him. Almost he heard her rather than saw her. It was as though he felt a whisper touch his face to turn him to see her where she lay in her mysterious light. I have reached to him. I have called him. His left to his right before him, I reflect cold lead from the sky and a fringing of pale gold from an edge of cloud lit by a sun too low now itself for him to see. And out here upon me, far from him, like a shadow, a shape of darkness mirrors the ridge that rides my farther shore behind me. His left half of it wooded and green, to his right of that a purple and brown slope of bogland rising. I speak of how I am then. Midway out before him, a bed of reeds bow in untidy unison before a soundless wind, casting blacker than themselves, their fused reflection trembling on my water's face. Left of him where he stands, a half-dead willow leans out above me, reaching stricken branches upward like a clawing hand. He is touched at first by a notion that I have not existed till this moment that he sees me. Then I touch with him a stronger notion, that I have existed since the beginning of the earth and have been waiting for him here have known of his long journey even as he made it, and known as he has not that it would bring him to me. He stood there before her, in a silence like no other silence he'd ever heard. He did not know what his feelings were. He felt emptied of feelings of his own, and not sure at all what quietly flooded into him to take their place. I know nothing of him, nothing of his life. Only what I see there, gazing on me from my shore. I see his pale, clear eyes of one who looks through this world and sees another. One bound by this ancient land in an enchantment, but who feels a stranger here. Come to me, O human child, and I shall give your soul a home. But he must go. He hardly dare turn from her. He will look back to her and the vision will be gone. No. Worse, to leave her will be to refuse her something, some acknowledgement, some tribute that is surely her ancient claim. Yet already the strip of forestry that part fringes her further shore is fallen into shadow, its green almost black. From here it must be still a good hour's ride and more to his grandparents' house. By then it will be almost night, and they will worry he must turn and go. Yes, it feels to him wrong to turn away from me. Simply to stand and see me, then turn from me and go. It seems inadequate. With a sense of something uncompleted, he turns, mounts his bike, and starts to pedal uneasily away. 
On that clumsy old contraption, he has ground out a good 60 miles since this morning, westward from his grandparents' house, way below, exploring an unknown road into what his grandma calls bad country, amid her Fenian villages in the bogland hills, where he does indeed feel foreign, inconspicuous, for he lives in England and has an English father there. In those villages, the scent of smouldering turf hangs on the damp air, to him an incense of mutiny. Toward midday, his first glimpse of the distant spires, twin and unequal of what must be Omar Cathedral, has beckoned him to a town, a mere name to him till now, remote as Babylon. And there beneath those spires, he has seen a signpost rich in other, yet more exotic names of an Ireland unknown to him, yet farther beyond. But those must wait for another pilgrimage. For today, from that Oma, he must begin now to work his roundabout way homeward, a different route, at first northeastward into the Sparren Mountains, likewise only a name to him till now. Thence the long pool eastward up against a mountain river to the bogland about its source, then southward over the shoulder of Slievegallion. And to me. Now reluctantly he pedals away, gives me one last parting look behind him and... Soon he is freewheeling, exhilarating miles of road hurtling, twisting down the mountainside between lonely upland farms amid chill whispering woodland in the fading light. Then the road straight, dipping before him, then rising far yonder, up over each crest, his free wheel taking him, and on down between patches of mountain bogland, along past wayside screens of spindly trees, at last levelling out into quieter country, and he's having to start to pedal again. Already, Impossibly soon, it seems, he has come down there to a forked junction onto a major road, and to his surprise, he's at the head of the two miles of wide main street that is the market town the locals call Long and Hungry. His grandparents live only a further 25 minutes pull on up from there. That marvel on the mountain top has been at their door all along. Up the back lanes at their little townland of Tandramoni with its lonely orange hall and row of prefabricated bungalow semis, grandly styled park rise. Where his grandparents live at number four, he must enter domesticity again. His grandparents he'll find sitting in the dark, for Grand always lets the last of the day pass in its own slow time. He sits on upright and motionless as the dusk thickens round him in his chair, until to some obscure prompting within he will stir and stand and set about his patriarchal evening lighting of the tilly lamp. Tonight that moment has not yet come. His grandmother will rise in startlement as he comes in at the door. God, take care of us, son. We had you dead and buried. Light the lamp, Daddy. We waited tea on you, son. From an old half-pound jam jar, his grandfather lifts the wick where it is soaked in mess all day and clips it about the Tilly's vaporizer column, brings lit match to it, and as the flame is dying, starts gentle pumping till the white mantle above takes light and explodes into hissing incandescence. His grandmother starts clattering with her kettle, blackened from hanging, ever simmering over the range. Where were you, son? Then he must make her sore that he has been into bad country and among Fenian villages, let alone to Oma, to her an evil wee place. But he's in his grandparents' house and feels it is only honest to share with them the places he has been. And Oma, he can assure her, he thought a smart wee town and very friendly. She'll purse her lips. She did not understand. No one did, except perhaps his grandfather, why he did all this toil from one signpost name to another. It was not simply to see these places. It was more to reach by his own effort, to win, to earn each place, make real its name and transmute it to some imprint in him and build up a presence of Ireland in his world within. Later, in his narrow bed in the tiny box room, he will... Lie awake, thinking of me, and thinking of me as humans do when they, as they call it, fall in love. 
and thinking of me, so he'll drift into sleep. And suddenly he'll wake, for he is hearing me, hearing my waters lap softly beneath his window, and yet not altogether softly, for there is in the sound a scratching, almost a rasping, as though I would claw my way up and through and into him. And he'll lie in a quaint uncertainty, not daring rise from his bed and come to his window, for fear he'll see that I am truly before him there, waters, reeds, rushes and all, come for him in the dark night nor daring rise and come, for fear he'll see that I am not. And out there is only his grandest kitchen garden. And soon he'll fall asleep again. And in the morning he'll see what the rasping noise was from the rips and rendings that rabbits' little gnawing teeth have torn in the leaves of the greens that grander toils to grow. More than once that boy will come again to me, but it must never be by that direct way through the long, hungry town and up my mountain road. Always he'll devise some roundabout journey, as though to come upon me unexpectedly again, and always from that first direction. Each time I touch him with the capricious thought, this time I'll not be here. He imagined me. But I am here. And no one else is ever here. Already I am touching him with another notion. Perhaps he alone knows that I exist. Each time he devisedly happens upon me, I am here for him alone. He found himself learning the lake. As systematically as he had learned away at his Latin verbs at school in England, he was memorising her as she appeared to him from this roadside shore from left to right along the length of her, feature by feature, each shape and colour. Obscurely, he felt he owed it her to do this, to print within him the content of that marvellous moment of his first sighting of her. He looked at her and looked at her and saw and drew each feature of her appearance into him. One time I show him further along where the road left me then. A uh, little headland of rough grass, thin dry bushes, saplings with a spit of shingle shelving down into the water. And out upon me before him, how had he not noticed it before? A little to his left, a small lake island overrun with trees and thickets. It had the look of once being centuries ago a wooden fortified lake dwelling, a cranog now long rotted and overgrown. The tangle of vegetation protected her now. Then he noticed, as though it had only this moment come into being, where over there a low, flat spit of grass and shingle projected from her too, though off to his left a little, like a mirror image of this on which he stood. And... An impulse forms in him to come to me at a secret time, in depths of night, and he and I alone awake. It seems a logical impulse to store in himself a nighttime presence of her too. The moon was over her half, he had idly noticed that. All this next week there could be good moonlight. The next clear night he will do it. He had cycled out by dead of night before stolen out that back window of his above Granda's kitchen garden, and freewheel and soundless where he could, whispered along the dark lanes and roads, through sleeping villages, or past a silent church that he imagined very much awake and unfavourably watching him. It had felt like a truancy, and it childishly thrilled him. Tonight a new, maturer emotion arises in him. Is this how he might feel? Were he to come back from the dead? A truant, sensing about him the banked energy of the living in their sleep, himself eternally an exile from them now. It felt strange but right. Tonight, this first time to be approaching the loch from this opposite direction. Beyond the long and hungry market town, he soon felt the land rising beneath him toward the mountain. No exhilarating freewheel now. In this moonlit dark, he had to toil up the long straights. Soon he had to come down to second gear, and pedalling too slowly and audibly for his liking, 
creek upward past the higher-lying farms with their vigilant and barking dogs. On the road's final steep upward twistings through the woodland, he had to come down to first. As he emerged onto the mountain's moonlit bare shoulder, the last few hundred yards, though almost level, he chose to go on foot, pushing the bike. It seemed right to approach the loch without effort or clumsiness and in silence. He is here, the haunted child. He has heard me call to him, and now he comes to me. But I will not greet him. I'll not smile for him nor welcome him. I lie here, cold and separate from him in the light of the moon, and do nothing. The coming is all for him to do. Out of sight from the road, he rested his bike amid the bushes above his spit of shingle. In this moonlight, out in the cold glitter of her water's face, the Cranog's tangle of vegetation showed black and its reflection fused to one shape of darkness as of some creature lurking just below. He knew what he was coming here to do. The loch seemed to confirm it. Upon her, a moonlight road of silver, studded with trembling platelets of black, beckoned to him like a path. Sheltered by the bushes, he took off his clothes and wrapped them in a towel. The poetic in him might be about a secret ceremony. The prosaic had packed a towel in the saddlebag. He felt an absurd sight to see and absurdly conspicuous. This was for sure the moment when someone would appear of all the night at this one hour, out of all Tyrone to this one place. A naturalist to do some night photography, or a fisherman, perhaps, or even a policeman stopping by for a pee who would arrest this naked boy for a blemish of the Queen's peace. Instantly he was angry with himself for such timorous thoughts. His true regard must be for this loch, his coming to her in nakedness must be in simple submission to make himself hers by some innocent performance secret to them both and by it step across a boundary into another world, enlist himself there and carry back with him into common day a secret, a mystery, a grail that no one else shall ever suspect he carries nor whose meaning ever understand. He is ashamed that he feels the ground and shingle harsh to his feet. Any discomfort or painfulness must be part of earning that grail he seeks. Daring not hesitate, he stepped over the shingle's crust into the water. The ground was suddenly soft beneath him. A cold, sandy mud, dangerously soft. It will for sure not hold him. The loch water was up to his knees already. A craven impulse took hold on him to turn and stumble out, forget this foolishness. But he knows if he does, he will be ashamed of himself forever. He would have failed the loch. And this cold, too, this cold of her water, is an element in this painful boundary that he must pass. This cold of her, so alien, so other, so real and frightening. This shocking, cruel, shriveling cold. He knelt clumsily down into her till the cold clasp of her clamped about his thighs, his groin, his breast, his shoulders. He took and held a deep breath, and as he plunged his head into her, kept his eyes willfully open to see the darkness that she was within. He almost expected to encounter distorted in the water some demonic female face, but he saw nothing. Rather, he saw a blackness blacker than he had ever known and heard such a deafening shock as her water stopped his hearing. For one terrible instant, he was thinking, was this the darkness of suddenly not seeing at all? Had he blinded himself? Had he killed his head? In that same instant, he thought, this is like a dying, deafening, freezing, blinding. Perhaps it is a dying. This loch has fastened herself about me to drag me down into her dark depth and never let me go. In terror, he thrashed to the surface. Gasping for breath, he sought about him on the alien, dazzling dark water's face to find his bearings. 
The Cranogs little point of shore, a black projection in the moonlight there, looked very near, but he knew it would take work to reach it. He was no great swimmer. He was one who kept going. It was a long labor before he felt the shelving of that other shingle graze his knees. And once he was on his Cranog, what was there he could do but simply be there? It was enough. It was more than enough. It was a richness to be there. Childlike, he sat naked on the grassy shingle, his legs straight before him, and felt he was no longer the boy who had physically come here, but the first of a race newborn here at the awakening of a new earth. Yet, even as he was thinking, this is my kingdom, he took an eerie notion that all the vegetation around him, the gorse and heather and bracken and bushes, all black alike in the night, was awaking to his presence, bristling into purposeful life. It would grow and spread to enlace him and engulf him, digest him, then retreat, be still again, and leave this spit of shingle virgin as it was before. He gazed across the sleeve of moonlit water to that opposite dark mainland shore. It seemed so far from him, and other, and it could indeed be, and here another fanciful notion took him, that he would find his bike there rusted. Its tires perished all but away, and on the road in his rags of clothes he could make no one see him, for he was dead seven years, and was a ghost. Already the sky was paling in the east. He should be making his cold, wet way back. For this short while, this island had been his alone. For these unique few moments, he had been lord of the Cranoak. Now this place, too, would be forever in his soul. And there he stands, his lifetime later, stricken on my shore that is wildness no more. Where was heather and rock is cleared and hard surface now, above a pathway of blue granite chippings. Where was shingle is blue granite dust. Behind him, where his lifetime gone, he first laid his old upright bicycle beside a rough and unfrequented mountain road, his bay-marked car park. It has passed wooden picnic tables and way markers that he has had to thread his way to me. So of course people come to see me now, where none ever came before. But it is not me they see. How can they, coming to me so many and so easily? He sees, and he alone among them all, the beauty that I was. And he grieved for another loss he saw reflected in her. No window onto enchantment now, compromised and managed, a lake like any other. He felt himself too a lesser being than was here before. She lay there a parable of his own sorry compromise of a life, in his profession, and relationships, so many junctures where he should have shown better self-respect and integrity. A broken marriage, his son and daughter estranged from him, two failed careers. So many wrong turns taken. How could the boy, once guided here by so sturdy a sense of direction, have become this shadow of a man who has so lost his way? He grieves, too, with a darker sadness. Even as now he looks at the loch, he can see how his sight is failing. He had refused surgery because of a significant risk it could lose him his sight altogether. He had chosen to let the condition take its course. That gave him the certainty of at least some time in the light. And often he had found himself speculating irrationally. Had the loch done this to him? In that terrible instant of darkness a lifetime ago when he opened his eyes within her black night water, he had thought, had he blinded himself? The question torments him now. In that moment, 
in some demonic transaction had he yielded her his eyes. Along the shore, his spit of grass and shingle is still there, but no longer a secret for a child of now to happen upon. The path of grey-blue chippings leads to it. From the bend of road above it, a double gate gives access, presumably, to boats. Perched in the water, a notice warns that bathing is prohibited. Not that there is purpose in his making the pilgrimage to his cranog again, even under cover of night. He has done it. Those moments are in him. Indeed, looking at it now with some better knowledge in these matters, he doubted it had ever been a Cranog at all. It looked to be not even an island. A causeway of vegetation seemed to join it to that opposite shore. He wished he had not come to see the loch again. He should have stayed faithful to his older, true image of her within. Stayed faithful, yes. She had astonished him once and touched in him some quickening and quickened him to an audacity. In his years since then, he had let that quickening die. It was as though she had vouchsafed him a gift and he had wasted it. He had betrayed her, all that lost. So much lost. Yet as he gazes nearly to tears on that miserable mutilation of her, she shows him clearly in another moment of sudden vision what all along from his very first sighting of her, a lifetime gone, she has been calling on him to do. He knows that once learned, nothing is ever forgotten. It lies buried only. He remembers himself as a student, hearing himself arguing in Latin. Drink taken, suddenly he's launching in and it's like running a tightrope, instant unerring access to irregular noun forms, ablatives, subjunctives, intricacies learned from the page, now there for the plucking as he races at speed. So now he sees he must transmute his onset of blindness to an uncovering from beneath all the intervening debris in his consciousness, his memory of that first sight of her. In the fading light of that day, his lifetime ago, Indeed, had she said to him, See me. Today has she called him to her shore again to show him this is precisely what now he must do. All those sightings through that last summer of his boyhood when he stood on her shore here, learning her, he must work to access them in his memory now, bring those before him in his inner eye, define them truly and truly see her as she was and make her visible again. Yes, by word shall he do that, word written, or when he can no longer see to write, by word spoken into some machine, word uncompromisingly sought and exact. He will waste his outward sight on that travesty of her no more. He will look within and recreate her. This too has she given him, a constructive rehearsal for his coming blindness. From deep within him, he shall recover her old wild shore. No car park, litter bins, grey-blue chipping pathway. His spit of grass and shingle, cleanse of litter and fouling. Clothe the hill beyond her in its old forest again, Strip away the outgrowth of vegetation that since has yoked her cran oak to the land. Give her again her bed of reeds to bow in their untidy unison before the soundless wind. The loch herself he shall restore in words to make her visible again to all forever. And thus his truer tribute to her shall be paid. With the gladness in him he had thought he would never again know a gladness and an unexpected purpose. He turns and goes. We live and move in many forms, we that haunt this unquiet land. 
Some of you mortal people tell how you see throngs of us scurry through the barley grasses as they bend their backs grey before the wind. A drunken man will tell how, staggering home by night, he had a pack of us cackling and snapping at his heels, till in his terror to put us behind him, he jumped a thorn hedge he could never clear of sober. By night too, some of you say, you hear our thin laughter as parties of us in our phantom coaches speed your dark road to carouse behind the lighted windows of a castle that is a sightless ruin by day. <laughs> How else can you speak of us? The shapes in which you see us are your own. You can have no way of seeing how we truly are. And among you are those who tell in the most uneasy tones of all how some few of us, the most to be feared, live solitary, each in the depths of one or other mountain lake, and lure you to her there to draw you down to her lair on the deep lake bed and hold you in enchantment to suck the goodness from you and spit the husk of you out upon her shore. Within a human instant you return to your world to all appearance unchanged. But you have been with us seven of our years and within you something is changed. Our soul is gone. We have stolen it. Not so with him, that's for sure. Whatever poor failing his life has been, or bitter triumph now, nothing of that is because I stole his soul. He knows that. I did not steal his soul. I gave it him. David Rudkin's To the Waters and the Wild was performed by Stephen Ray and Francis Tomalty, directed by Jack McNamara, with sound and music by Adam McCready. It was produced by New Perspectives Theatre Company, funded by the Space and Arts Council England. If you have enjoyed this podcast, please consider supporting us with a review and subscribing to the series. To learn more about our work and watch the accompanying short films by Grant G, please visit newperspectives.co.uk